All right. Tonight we're going to talk about covenants. Covenants. Um, one of the things that I have found in talking to different people of all sorts, even, even among Christian people, is that there's terms that we use that are, are biblically based, but that people don't really know the, the full meaning of those terms. And covenant, I would say, is one of those words. And so I was prompted to look into this more deeply. And I won't say that this is all that can be said on the subject, but there was certainly a lot here that, that gave me more understanding and particularly concerning where we are in time right now. Because that, that there's some aspects of covenant that pertain to time. And we'll get to this. But first of all, let me just give you the meaning from Strong's Concordance, from Hebrew and from Greek, of the word covenant. And in both Hebrew, which is the Old Testament, and Greek, which is the New Testament, there's really only one word used for covenant. Now, that's kind of an unusual thing in itself. There's a lot of English words that are actually several different Greek words or several different Hebrew words, but covenant isn't like that. In Hebrew, in the Old Testament, the word for covenant is berith. And it's a, a covenant. It can be a confederacy or a league. And the point there is that it is an agreement made between parties. But the origin of the word is really very interesting because it comes from the word meaning to cut a piece of meat. Now, of course, we'll, we'll get into the, you know, how in Genesis, how God made a covenant with Abraham, and he asked Abraham to, to sacrifice these animals and split them in two parts, and Abraham went down the middle. So I guess that's how the Hebrew language um, associated the word covenant with cutting a piece of meat. But... There's another interesting thing about covenant, and that is that in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, there's a meal involved. There's food. There's drink. There's bread and there's wine, you know, in the New Covenant. And in the Old Covenant, the sacrifices were for the priests to eat, okay? In Greek, the word is diatheke, which actually means a disposition uh, or like a, a, a will, somebody's will of their, their willing their property to somebody or rather to their heirs. Uh, and it's used to mean a contract uh, or a covenant. Literally, though, Diaseki in Greek means to put something aside, to set it aside for a particular purpose. Now, see, this is where this is where this begins to have the new covenant begins to have some end time applications because <clears throat> what Jesus did <clears throat> for us. On the cross, we have not fully partaken of it yet. There still awaits a full, complete Sabbath rest for the people of God, as it says in Hebrews. Now, there are other words that are related to the word covenant. For example, a compact, you know, from American history, when the Puritans came over here, on the Mayflower, they made a, the Mayflower Compact, which was uh, their 
covenant, their agreement of what they were going to do once they got to the new world. It's kind of served as a prototype, if you will, for the United States Constitution. And then there is an accord. And I'm not talking about a Honda Accord. I'm talking about a, a, a treaty that's, that several different nations all agree to. And I'm not necessarily a peace treaty after a war because then you kind of have that imposed upon a party. And, and one of the things different about a covenant rather than a, 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 a peace treaty at the end of the war is it's kind of like you're, you're forced at the end of the war. The, you're forced to surrender and you're forced to sign terms of peace. But a covenant is something which is willingly entered into by all the parties. And, for example, there is this thing called the Oslo Accords. And, you know, the Kyoto Accords about climate change and pollution and all of this. I'm not saying that that's good, but I'm saying that the, the nations that participate in that have all said, we agree to this, which gets to the first point about covenant as it is in the Bible. Go to Amos chapter 3. Now, my point, or I believe God's point in having us study this, is that he is a covenant maker. That covenant is something very <clears throat> special, very important to God. And in fact, uh, the word testament, you know, we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. Well, in Greek, the word testament is the same word as the word covenant. So this is the, the, the new diatheke is the New Testament. Okay, so uh, in Amos chapter 3, you see, we're looking at, I'm trying to look at this, or I believe God wants us to look at this. From his point of view, we as Christians, and I guess probably the Jews do the same thing, tend to look at the covenants God has made with us from our perspective of like, okay, we we gave our heart to Jesus, so here's what he has promised us in return. Okay, that's good. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But that's only looking at it from our point of view. And God is revealing, from his point of view, a lot more in this business of him making a covenant with us than I think that we have realized. And, for example, when he created Adam, and he placed him in the garden. Well, that just him, him breathing life into Adam and then putting him in the garden uh, was, was a covenant of sorts. It doesn't say, doesn't use that word back in Genesis chapter 2, but that was in effect what, what he did because he gave life to humanity and he put some stipulations out there for Adam to agree to. Now, Adam and Eve didn't, they didn't keep their part of the bark, and, and that's, that's a whole other story, which we'll get into a little bit. But the point was, life itself is a form of a covenant. Just the fact that, that we're alive means that God has made an agreement with us. We, we are, uh, as Rush Limbaugh used to say, we're on loan from God. <laughs> Right? Okay? You know, we, our life is, is, a, is a lease that God has given us. Okay? So here in Amos chapter 3, we see that, um, that God expects us to keep our end of things, and he's not happy with us when we don't. Okay? Amos 3. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt. Now, of course, that pertains to the old covenant, you know, that, the covenant at Mount Sinai, the, the law that God gave Moses. And I'm not going to go into that 
because we're people of the new covenant. So we're looking at this from where we are now. We're looking at covenant from, from now, looking back, rather from back then going forward. Okay. He, but this is what he said to them. He said, you only have I chosen and sympathized with. Now, see, that is, that is the nature of God's covenant with us. Now, that doesn't mean he hates, uh, you know, everybody who's not in a covenant with him, but he wants them to get in a covenant with him so that he can be merciful. It's like you need to be in a covenant with him to have the benefits. I mean, you need to sign a contract with your cell phone provider to, to get cell phone service. <laughs> Right? If you don't sign a contract with them, you can get this thing out and play with it all you want to, and it ain't going to work. It's a covenant, right? He says, okay, you, he chose them. He chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and David, and so forth. He said, therefore, I will visit upon you all your wickedness and punish you for all your iniquities. Well, well that's not very nice. Why is he doing that? Because they were in a covenant with him. It's like, so you don't want to break a covenant. A, a covenant is, it, it's, it's like a law, but it's even more than a law. It, it, that, the whole thing about the split, splitting the, the sacrifices into two pieces, and then Abraham and God walked down the middle of that, was an indication that if you break this thing, you're going to be like one of those pieces of meat there. It's a serious thing, in other words. And then he says in verse 3, he says, Do two walk together, except they have made an appointment and have agreed. Well, this is interesting because that word, the, the Amplified really gets it. That, that word agree doesn't just mean that they have the same opinion. Okay, the agree actually means to meet together. It could mean a summons to court. It could mean to be engaged to be married. It could mean uh, for a congregation to assemble together. But the actual meaning of it has to do with to set a time. It's an appointment. Right? If you go to the doctor uh, or you go to get car service, you have to make an appointment, or at least where I go, you, you do. Or to get your hair cut, you have to make an appointment. You fix a time. Okay, that, that's critical here. Now, there is another, of course, in the New Testament, uh, use of the word agree. You know this one, Matthew 18, 19. You know, if, if you've listened to faith preachers at all, ever, you've heard them talk about, well, if two or more of you agree touching anything, well, that's what they're quoting here. They're quoting Matthew 18, 19. But again, it doesn't just mean that if you both have the same opinion about something. Matthew 18 Verse 19, and Jesus says, <clears throat> I tell you, if two of you on earth agree touching anything. Now let me stop right there. He brings up being on earth because in verse 18, he, he makes this other point, which we have, have been using a lot, and that is binding and loosing. But he makes the point in, in binding and loosing that if you're going to bind something, that is to declare it to be unlawful, to forbid it, or if you're going to loose it, to allow it, it needs to be in agreement with what God says. Right? You don't go binding stuff that God has ordained, and you go, don't go loosing stuff that God is opposed to. Okay, now, anyway, so that's why he says about on earth and on heaven, you know, uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So 
it, it's again talking about our, our being joined together with God. Again, I tell you, if two of you on earth agree, harmonize together, make a symphony together. Boy, that's some musical words there, isn't it? Well, that's what the word actually means. The Greek word for agree has to do with sound. Symphonia, from which we get the word symphony. Literally, symphonia in Greek means to sound together or to make the same sound. All right? So it's like, all, all in favor say I. I. All opposed, no. Well, see, that's, all, that's asking people to agree, to make the same sound or to, to be in unison, I guess. Okay? Make a symphony together about anything that they ask, it will come to pass and be done for them by my Father in heaven, assuming that it's lawful in heaven. It says, for wherever two or three are gathered, are drawn together. See, there's that Hebrew meaning of covenant, to be assembled together. So, verse 19 and 20 only work properly in God's arrangement of things when we are in covenant with Him. I've told you that I've told this testimony many times and I'm not going to go through it again about the time when I was in college and I was running from the Lord and smoking pot and I was running around with some people and and this this girl apparently her mother was a Christian she said I heard this this preacher on TV say if you'll just get an agreement for anything you can have it. and so we all got an agreement we'd find somebody with pot and we did <laughs> and, but that wasn't God that brought that in to pass but that was a counterfeit of this right here. But if you are in agreement with God and you are in agreement together as his people, you may ask anything and it will be done for you by your Father in heaven, provided that it's lawful in heaven. And if it's not lawful in heaven and you get it, it didn't come from God. Okay. Anyway, keep the place in Matthew. Go to Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> Something else we can say about covenant. Is that it implies, more than just implies, it, it actually requires faith. It requires trust. Just like a contract for your cell phone or anything else. If you're going to sign on the dotted line, you are expressing your faith that that, that agency or whatever is going to perform what you have asked them to do. <clears throat> Otherwise, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't agree to it. You wouldn't sign on the dotted line. You know, if you buy that car and you really don't think it's going to be a good car. Well, most car companies will even they have the lemon law. You know, you can even come back in next number of days and say, well, I'm not happy with this purchase. I want my money back, and they're supposed to do that. And most stores will do that with the, with the purchase, too. But when we're talking about life, and we're talking about time, and we're talking about God's dealings with humanity... Trust and faith is, is part of the deal. I mean, if you don't have faith in God, then you don't have a covenant with Him. And well, let's look at it from His point of view. He obviously has some kind of faith in us that He would make an offer to us. I mean, He created us in the first place. So He believes, he, a place, I'm going to give you an opportunity to, to walk with me and, and to live the way I would want you to live. He, he offers us that knowing that, well, maybe some people won't, but, but he trusts us enough to make the decision for ourselves. See, this is one of the reasons why I don't really fully go with everything Calvinists say because they kind of, 
they kind of make it work. Well, it's not even really your choice. God decided to save you, so there's just nothing you can do about it. Well, no, that's not a covenant then. A covenant means he has his will, and you decided, yeah, I want that, and so I will step out, and I'll sign on the dotted line. Now, you know, some theologians have a problem with that. It's like, well, you're saying that it's a leap of faith, that it's just your, it's a shot in the dark, and you don't really know. Well, I'll tell you what, sometimes it really seems that way. Sometimes it really seems, when you pray, and you don't know how, what the outcome's going to be, then, then you have to exercise faith. And, and that's part of this deal. It's like, it, there's a scripture in there that says, well, if you have to see it, then that's not faith. Because faith is the, the evidence of things not seen. Okay, Hebrews 4, verse 1. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still holds and is offered today, let us be afraid to distrust it. That's an interesting way to put that. It's saying, let, let's, let's trust him, but let's be afraid to distrust him. Lest any of you should think that he has come too late and has come short of reaching it. For indeed, we have had the glad tidings proclaimed to us just as truly as they, the Israelites of old, did when the, the good news of deliverance from bondage came to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because it was not mixed with faith. And neither were they united in faith with the ones, Joshua and Caleb, who heard it and did believe. See, there's one of those aspects of assembling together. You know, over there in Hebrews chapter 10, it talks about not forsaking the assembling together as some do, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Well, why would the approaching of the day of the Lord make it more urgent and more mandatory than it ever has been that the body of Christ continue to assemble and continue to, to hold together as a community? Because that as the days go by, you know, Jesus even said, well, when I come back, am I going to find faith on this earth? It's like the stuff going on on earth is going to become more and more detrimental to faith that people are going to need that bonding together with other people in order to stand during those times. <clears throat> and so, verse 3, For we who have believed do enter into the rest. You know, up there in verse 1, it says, hey, it's still offered today. We have not come too late. That's good news. We do enter into that rest in accordance with his declaration that those who did not believe uh, would, not or would not enter into his rest. And he said this even though he had already rested from his works there in Genesis chapter uh, 1. So we're not talking about the seventh day of the week. We're, and we're not talking about observing a day when we assemble together. We're not talking about being seventh day uh, assemblers. We're talking about trust. Now I mentioned, keep the place here in Hebrews too. I mentioned uh, Abraham and, and the sacrifice that he made. Let's go back and look at that here just a moment. Genesis chapter 15. <clears throat> because Abraham is our example of how faith is supposed to operate. Because God invited Abraham into a covenant, into a relationship and promised Abraham something that was highly improbable from Abraham's point of view. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield, 
your abundant compensation and your reward shall be great. And Abram said, well, Lord God, what can you give me since, since I am going from this world childless? And he, he who shall be uh, my heir, the heir of my house, is this steward Eliezer of Damascus. Look, you've given me no child, and a servant born in my house is my heir. <clears throat> it's interesting that when God comes to Abram and says, I'm going to make a covenant with you, the thing that Abram is most concerned about is how this covenant is going to affect future generations, not just himself. I think this is, this is something that's not maybe talked about enough in Christian circles. I think actually Jews probably take that a little bit more seriously because they have this, this ethnic and national identity wrapped up in their Jewishness. It's like it's not just about me and my immediate family and my prosperity and what goes on in my life. It's like there is, there is the, the Jews and, and the, the posterity, that it's all about posterity, see? And, hey, we have a Christian posterity. The Christian faith has survived 2,000 years through all kinds of disruptions and all kinds of, of horrible things that went on. So the, the fact that Abram is not just thinking about, you know, well, I want a son. He's not just talking about that. He's, he's looking at, well, okay, God, you're going to make an agreement with me, but if I don't have any heirs, then it's just with me, and I don't think that's right. I think this should, this should carry on. All right? And verse 4, so behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, well, this man, Eliezer Damascus, shall not be your heir, but he that shall come from your own body shall be your heir. And that was improbable because he was nearly 100 years old at that time. And so God brought him outside of his tent into the starlight and said, look toward the heavens and count the stars. And if you're able to number them, then that's how numerous your descendants shall be. And this is, this is the point here. This is how a covenant is enacted. And Abraham believed and trusted in and relied on what the Lord said. And God counted it to him as righteousness, as right standing. Romans chapter 4 describes that whole situation this way, and it applies it to us. It, it says, use Abraham as an example of, of what God, how God wants us to be toward him. Romans chapter 4. Verse 16. Therefore, inheriting the promise, well, what promise? Well, any promise, but we're talking about a covenant promise. Inheriting the promise is the outcome of faith and depends on faith in order that it might be given as an act of grace. See, uh, we've talked about this before. Grace and mercy are not the same thing. Grace is something that God gives, he bestows. Mercy is something that he shows. He shows mercy to us. He doesn't deal with us according to what we deserve. Okay, that's his mercy. But his grace is what he has promised us. Okay, if, if, you, uh, if you pray for something and the prayer is answered, well, that's grace. That's God's grace that is being brought to us through that answer to the prayer. That it might be given as an act of grace, that God, it will be from God, and that will make it stable and valid and guaranteed to all of Abram's descendants, not only to the devotees of the law, but to those who share the faith of Abraham. Verse 18, for Abraham, human reason being gone, he hoped on, 
that he should become the father of many nations as he had been promised. And he did not weaken in faith when he considered the utter impotence of his own body, which was as good as dead because he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's dead and womb. No unbelief or distrust made him waver or doubtingly question the promise of God. Now let me stop there. Just having unbelief or distrust per se is not a deal breaker. I'm not saying it's good, but you can press on in spite of that, and that's, that, that would be not wavering. Okay, the, the Lord promises this, and, and it, you know, it doesn't say that he, he never, you know, wave, he never had any other thoughts about it. But it, he, didn't, he didn't throw God's promise out. He didn't say, oh, well, okay, I guess God's just not going to do what he said. He never did that. Well, well, yeah, they all say that. That would be wavering. He didn't give up on God. But he grew strong and was empowered by faith as he gave praise and glory to God. Fully assured and satisfied that God was able and mighty to keep his word and do what he promised. And that is why his faith was credited to him as righteousness. Okay, go to Ephesians chapter 1. So what we've said thus far is that a covenant is an agreement between parties and it's, there's faith involved that you have to trust the, the one you're making the agreement to. But there's also in the one who is extending the offer, there is an intent. Now, I keep using the cell phone as an example. Well, the intent of a cell phone company, AT&T or Verizon or whoever you want to use, their intent is to make money, <laughs> okay? I mean, it's a business after all, okay? And surely you understand that when you, when you sign up with them. You understand, okay, I'm going to have to pay them X amount of money if, if for my use of this phone. But it's like that, that is part of, there is an intent involved. Now, this is one of those things where I'm not sure the body of Christ always understands what God's intent is in saving us. We look at, at our salvation as, from our point of view, you know, we, we look at our salvation as, well, now I don't go to hell for my sins. Or, you know, if, if we're full gospel, we look at it as, well, well, God will, you know, he'll heal me. God will answer my prayer, uh, you know, and, and all of the promises in the Bible. He'll save my loved ones. Uh, he'll keep storms from destroying my house, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I'm not saying any of that's bad, but that's not really, that doesn't fully express God's intent for saving us. He's got something bigger in mind. Let's see what that is. Go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In him we have redemption through Jesus' blood, the remission and forgiveness of our offenses in accordance with the riches and generosity of his gracious favor, which he lavished upon us. Let me stop right there. Do you realize that it benefits God for people to stop sinning? <laughs> You know, I mean, now, it doesn't hurt him like it hurts you when you sin, okay? If you sin, it hurts you, okay? But it actually helps. When you stop sinning and begin serving God, 
You are, you are putting, pushing forward his agenda. You are pushing forward his program. You're accomplishing what he wants done. He doesn't have to go find somebody else to do it because you're doing what he wants you to do. Right? So, so God benefits from you not sinning. <clears throat> so he, ha he has a stake in that. It's not just for your benefit. <coughs> and it says that he, <coughs> excuse me, lavished upon us every kind of wisdom and understanding and practical insight and prudence. Well, there again, you think we're the only one that's going to benefit from wisdom? Now, I know there was a place in Job where where, uh, you know, the one that's correcting Job tells Job, well, you know, if you're, if you're wise, it's only for you, and if you're, you're evil, well, that doesn't hurt God. Okay, I agree, it doesn't hurt God. And, yes, our stupidity doesn't make God fall off his throne. But certainly, things in this world are going to go better when the earth is full of the knowledge of the Lord, like the waters cover the sea. And it's not that way right now. Why is it not that way right now? Because people are sinning. They're doing their thing. And so God wants us to be wise. And so that's why he gives us his wisdom. Making known to us the mystery of his will, of his plan and purpose. And it's this. In accordance, see there's that word accord, that, that's, that's covenant there we're talking about. This is covenant we're reading here. This is the new covenant we're reading here. In accordance with his good pleasure, his merciful intention, which he previously purposed and set forth in Jesus. See, Jesus is the bringer of the new covenant. God planned for the maturity of times and the climax of the ages. And guess what? We're not there yet. So there's more of the new covenant, covenant that is yet to be fulfilled and yet to be enacted. To unify all things and head them up and consummate them in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth. <clears throat> and in Him... We were made God's heritage, and we obtained an inheritance. For we had been foreordained and chosen in accordance with his purpose, who works out everything in agreement with the counsel and design of his own will. And that verse right there is one of those where, where the, the Calvinist will say, well, see there, if God wants it to happen, it's going to happen. Well, <clears throat> okay, but whether or not we get to participate in what happens, we get a choice in that. Okay, verse 12, so that we who first hoped in Christ, who put our confidence, our trust, our faith in him, may live for the praise of his glory. See, if you don't believe, it, believe God and don't trust him, your life is not going to glorify God. Okay, e, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. God, so rich is he in his mercy because of and in order to satisfy the great and intense love with which he loved us, even when we were dead by our shortcomings and trespasses, he made us alive in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself, the same new life with which he quickened him. This is the new covenant we're reading here. This, this is Christianity. This is, this is what, what was it C.S. Lewis wrote a, a word called uh, mere Christianity. <laughs> this is mere Christianity here, okay? I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing, but this is, this is what it's all about. For it is by grace and mercy which we did not deserve that we're saved. And God raised us up together with him 
and made us sit down together in the heavenly sphere by virtue of our being in Christ Jesus the Messiah. That's why if we bind things that are bound in heaven, we can do it as Christians, or we can loose things that are loosed in heaven because of our covenant. Our covenant connects us with heaven, just like your covenant with the cell phone company connects you with that tower out there, right? It's our covenant. And he did this, verse 7, so that he might clearly demonstrate through the ages to come the immeasurable limitless, surpassing riches of his free grace. We had not gotten all the grace we're going to get yet. His unmerited favor and his kindness and goodness of heart toward us in Christ Jesus. Hebrews chapter 6. Verse 17, God in his desire, see, this is, he has a desire. It's not just about what we want, it's about what he wants. It's not just, well, I want to be saved, and so, God, oh, okay, I'll save you. No, it's not that. God has a plan. That's why he saved us. In his desire to show more convincingly and beyond doubt to those who were to inherit the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose and plan, he intervened with an oath. Now we're talking about his word here. And we're talking about the Holy Spirit revealing his word. Okay, he intervened with an oath so that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath in which it's impossible for God to ever prove false or deceive us. We who have fled to him for refuge, meaning we who have made a covenant with him. We've given him our, our life. We've, we've given him our heart. We've prayed the sinner's prayer. We've made a commitment to, be, to walk with Jesus. We who have fled to him for refuge might find mighty indwelling strength and strong encouragement to grasp and hold fast the hope appointed for us. See, that's what Abraham did, and that's what he can do for us, and we need it. We need to grab hold of that. Because if there in Hebrews chapter 2, it says, because if you don't, you could, it could just slip away. I mean, you could just let it slip away. If you're not holding on to it, if you're not holding on to the steering wheel, that car might go somewhere you don't want it to go. Right? Okay. Or you're riding a horse and you let go of the reins. Well, the horse may decide he wants to go to the barn and you don't want to go to the barn. Well, too bad. That's where you're going. Okay. Uh, verse 19. Now we have that hope set before us as a sure, steadfast anchor to the soul. We're talking about the word. We're talking about what the word has revealed to us. That's the hope that's set before us. We're not talking about, well, I hope I'll win the lottery tomorrow, or, well, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. I'm, that, that, that's not hope. That's just wishes. The hope is what God has said. This is my plan. This is where things are going. But you don't see any of that. So you say, well, okay, God said it, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to order my life uh, in that direction. Okay, that's our hope. And it, we have it as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. It cannot slip. It cannot break down upon whoever step, steps out upon it. It's a hope that reaches farther and enters into the very certainty of the presence within the veil. Where Jesus has entered in for us in advance. A forerunner having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Let me see if I can put into words something I think that, you know, ministers and ministries a lot of times they say, well, I have, I have the word for 2023. Okay, I, I've got, you know, here, here's our slogan for the year. Okay, well, you could kind of put this in that category, sort of, not, not exactly. But I think what God has, has caused me to... Uh, focus on 
for this upcoming year is see the end from the beginning. See past the present to the, 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 the outcome. Just like in a, in a marathon. You know, I remember when I ran my first marathon in Houston back in 2002. I, you get to a place what they call you hit the wall. You've gone, you've gone till about all of the, the blood sugar that you have stored up in your muscles has all been depleted and so you're having to run on um, something else uh, to, to get where you're wanting to go. And you don't really feel like going on, but you know that you haven't come to the finish line yet. <clears throat> well, in Houston, we got to this one place where we were actually heading back east toward downtown. We'd come all the way out to the Galleria, which is on the west side of town. And then we were going to go through this park, this trail that goes through this big honking park. And you could see the skyscrapers down, and they were six miles ahead of you. But they said, run toward the skyscrapers. And so I think that's kind of what our word for 2023 is. We see the vision of Jesus coming again, of the end times. We see it. We have it preached here at Romans 8 a lot, probably more than any place I know of. Okay, that message of the coming of the Lord, of the end times, and of, of Jesus is going to be here and he's going to rule and reign. In the millennial kingdom, and the earth is going to be better than it's ever been since the Garden of Eden. That's the skyscrapers up there that we're running toward. And so just keep going that way. And, you know, if you come to a speed bump along the way or a curve in the trail or whatever, we'll just keep going. That's, I think, what the Lord's telling me. is like, you know, there may be some, um, some jostling along the way. But, but don't be looking at that. Look beyond that. See the end. See the finish line. You know, see Jesus standing there on the Mount of Olives saying, I have returned. Now take that or leave it. Okay. Hebrews chapter 9. Now here's something else. Here's something else about... What was that? What did I miss down there? Well, all right. <laughs> then my living has not been in vain, as the old gospel song said. Okay. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, points out what the price was. In fact, I should say what the price is. Now, there's some implications of this we're going to get into here in just a minute. The price of a covenant is there is sacrifice. Now, in the, uh, in the analogy of your cell phone contract, the sacrifice is you, you have to pay your hard-earned money you know, to, to use that. And I guess their sacrifice on their end is they have to build all of this stuff and hire all of this people all these people to, to do their business. I mean, it doesn't just run itself, you know. And so there, there is a cost. There is a price. And this ultimate covenant that we're talking about had an ultimate price that only God himself could pay. And so he became a human in the form of Jesus to pay that price. But I want us to understand the business of a price because that is inherent in a covenant. Okay, let's talk about being married. There's a price to pay for that. You know, you don't get to go, you know, dating everybody out there on the block anymore or going to bed with them or whatever, you know, people do when they're single. You don't do that anymore. If you made a marriage covenant, and if you made your marriage covenant and then you're still doing that, then your marriage is really, you, you know, that covenant is worthless. You know, you didn't mean it if you're doing that. Okay? And not only that, but, you know, you, you can't always, you know, if, if you're married, you can't always eat the food you want to eat. Or you can't always go the places you want to go. Or you may, your wife may want you to go somewhere you don't want to go, like Walmart. Okay, <laughs> Right? Okay, but see, 
there's a price involved in a covenant. All right? And the bigger the covenant, the bigger the price. And so the new covenant God has made with humanity is huge because he paid such a big price for it. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. Christ the Messiah is therefore the negotiator and mediator of an entirely new agreement or testament or covenant so that those who are called and offer it may receive the fulfillment of the promised everlasting inheritance. I've got something to say about that in a moment. But, but it says we can do that because a death has taken place which rescues and delivers and redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first agreement. For where there is a last will and testament, see, a, 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 a will, when somebody dies and they will have a will for their heirs, that's a covenant. It says, for that to be enacted, the death of the one who made it must first be established. For a will and testament is valid and takes effect only at death since it has no force or legal power as long as the one who made it is alive. So even the first covenant of God's will was not inaugurated and ratified and put in force without the shedding of blood. This was animal sacrifice there. For when every command of the law had been read by Moses, he took the blood of slain calves and goats together with water and scarlet wool with a bunch of hyssop and sprinkled both the book of the law, which was the old covenant, itself, and he sprinkled the people. See, so he brought the, the two parties together, saying, this is the blood that seals and ratifies the agreement which God has commanded me to deliver to you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with blood the tabernacle and all the vessels and appliances used in worship. In fact, under the law, almost everything is purified by means of blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is neither release from sin and its guilt, nor the remission do and merited punishment for sin. And this is why, you know, let the place go in Hebrews, go back to Matthew. This is why Jesus, when he had that last supper, the Passover meal with his disciples before he was crucified, why he referred to his body and his blood in the partaking of this meal. See, once again, a meal signifies the covenant. And those bulls and calves and goats that were slain under the old covenant, now there were certain ones that they, there's one that they sent off alive into the wilderness called a scapegoat, and there were certain ones that they didn't eat, that they burned the whole thing up totally, but most of them, they, they cut the meat up and the priests cooked that and that's how they ate. Because see, the priests weren't given land to, to cultivate, to grow crops and to grow, uh, you know, herds and things. They had to live off of the sacrifices. And, and as, as one who has lived off of the sacrifices of God's people for 40, how many years is it now? For, 43, 44, 45 well, 40, 45. There'll be 45 in the fall this year. <clears throat> I can tell you, you have to have faith that, uh, that, that God's people are going are gonna to give into the offering uh, of your church. Otherwise, you, you find a, 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 an avocation, you find a side hustle to, to, to supplement your income. And, and I, look, I've done that too. Steve Jordan does that too. There's not, I mean, Paul did it. So it's, that's nothing sinful about having a side hustle. But, the, but Paul even makes the point, hey, you know, under the old covenant, they that, lived, they that served the temple lived off of the offerings. 
But my point is, uh, you know, in this day and time, uh, church attendance is at an all-time low in America. And the places where it's not at an all-time low are places that are third world countries that are not particularly rolling in dough. So, so you, we, you know, every week I have to thank God for supplying my needs. And we do. Even if you're not a, in the ministry, you really are in the ministry, by the way, if you're a Christian. But even if you're not living off of the offerings given to a church, you still should recognize that your covenant with God through Jesus Christ means that you are depending on Him. You're not depending on the banking system. You're not depending on the U.S. government. You're not depending on any other natural source as your means of livelihood. You're depending on God. Now, he can use all of those other things to, to give you livelihood. But, see, this is, this is the point. Anyway, back to Jesus. Um, 26, Matthew 26, verse 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and, praising God, gave thanks and asked God to bless it for their use. And when he had broken it, he gave it to the disciples, said, Take, eat, this is my body. Now, some, you know, some not very, not very clever people would read this and say, Well, he's promoting cannibalism. No, he's not. He's making an analogy. He's making a metaphor. He's saying that his body is offered as a covenant. And that them eating of this bread is their way of showing that they are willing participants in that covenant. And he took a cup when he had given thanks, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant. And no, he was not promoting vampirism, which is being ratified, is a new agreement being ratified and is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And I say to you, I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it with you of new and of superior quality in my Father's kingdom. Well, in the millennial kingdom, what is going to be better about wine than what wine is now? Well, for one thing, wine now will get you drunk. And it can cause... a, a uh, uh, an abuse of it over many years can cause cirrhosis of the liver. And um, even, even if it's not to that extent, wine right now is fermented. And fermentation, just like yeast, implies there's something corrupt. There, there is a degradation. There is a, a chemical change that has happened to make the thing different than what it was supposed to be. And see, that reflects what has happened to humanity since Adam and Eve in the garden. Okay, that's why our, our human nature is in our blood. You know, it talks about that in, uh, in 1 Peter. It says, well, you know, you've been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus, and you've been redeemed from the fruitless way of living inherited from your ancestors. It's in your DNA, in other words. Okay, if, go back to Ephesians. You let the place in Matthew go. Go back to Ephesians. Now, all through here, I've been pointing out uh, what covenant involves. You know, I said it's an agreement between parties. It requires our faith and our trust. It expresses the intent of the one offering the covenant. And a sacrifice has to happen to trigger it, to bring it into effect. Now, it, goes, it should go without saying that there are terms and conditions for every covenant. Now, some in Christianity today want to kind of minimize or overlook that that they, they would say, well, okay, Jesus did it all. He paid for all my sins, so he doesn't require anything of me. 
Well, even those people probably would still admit, well, it requires faith after all. I mean, I, I can't be an atheist and say I've got a covenant with Jesus. I mean, you know, and, and you know, some people are even trying to say that. Well, if you're an atheist, you can still go to heaven. Well, no, that's not the new covenant. That's some kind of false religion there. Okay, but <clears throat> there are terms and conditions, just like with your cell phone. You know, when you, when you signed up for that program, there's terms and conditions that you agreed to. And you better read all the fine print because some of those things that, that you agreed to, you might really kind of have some second thoughts about. But just saying. Anyway, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. The purpose of what God had in mind, and it, in verse Nine, it says this is a mystery that's been hidden from humanity by and large. In verse 10, it says that purpose is that through <clears throat> the church. Now, this is talking about us now. Through us who have partaken, who, are, who have signed on the dotted line to be part of God's covenant. Through us, the complicated, many-sided wisdom of God in all of its infinite variety and innumerable aspects might now be made known <clears throat> to angelic rulers and authorities, principalities and powers in the heavenly sphere. And this is in accordance with the terms of the eternal and timeless purpose with which he realized and carried into effect in the person of Christ Jesus our Lord. Did you know that when you got saved... You signed on to a purpose that you were going to stand against the devil and his spirits. That's what it's telling you right here. Well, now you do. You, you, you made an, when you got saved, you made an agreement to, to sock it to the devil and his critters, all of them. And... and there, there's a lot mentioned here in this verse that's more than just the demons that we cast out of people. I mean, that's a whole other story in itself. Maybe I'll get into that another time. But anyway, and it says, this is in accordance with the purpose of Jesus dying for us. So if we accept that as him as our Savior, then through us, God is going to sock it to the devil. Now, he does, he's not limited by us. He can do things we can't do. And ultimately, we're not going to stop the Antichrist from coming to power. And we're not going to stop the New World Order and all that. Jesus himself is going to do that when he returns. But God is at least going to keep us in a place of safety where it's not going to overwhelm us and overpower us and destroy us. Hallelujah. Okay, verse 12. And in Jesus, because of our faith in him, we dare to have boldness courage, and confidence of free access, unreserved approach to God with freedom and without fear. That's the only way to come against the devil. You don't want to come against the devil any other way than that. Because he'll, he'll growl at you. He'll intimidate you otherwise. Uh, go to Jeremiah chapter 34. How are we doing on time back there? Well, I'm not going to drag this out, but uh, Jeremiah chapter 34, verse uh, 18, is talking about the old covenant and that it had terms and conditions. And that Israel came under judgment here Jeremiah is telling them because they didn't keep the terms and conditions. Uh, Jeremiah 34, verse 18. It said, The men who have transgressed my covenant, who have not kept the terms of the covenant or the solemn pledge which they made before me, I will make them like the sacrificial calf which they cut in two and then passed between, solemnizing their pledge. I will make the men like the calf. So you see 
that the terms and conditions of it, it's just like with your cell phone, the terms and conditions uh, are like if you don't pay your bill, then they're going to shut it off after so many um, month, you know, so many days or whatever. Or if you decide I'm, I'm going to terminate my contract uh, before the the period, the time period elapsed, so they say, well, okay, then you owe X number of months that you didn't pay because you've terminated the contract. We'll see that these people acted as if they terminated the contract. So God says, okay, go ahead, you're going to die. See, that's why I know that God's deal, arrangement with Adam was a covenant. Because God said, okay, you can eat everything. You know, here we are, we're in the garden. Just, just go, have fun, enjoy, you know, name all the animals. Uh, you know, eat everything except that tree over there. Because if you eat that tree over there, you're going to die. They ate that tree, they died. Humans die because they ate that tree. It's in the blood. Now, Jesus came to fix that, <clears throat> but we got to stay in the covenant. If we get outside the covenant... There is judgment. Now, let's talk about that because that's an interesting little tidbit there. Go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Now, Steve talks about this a lot. And one of the reasons that he spends so much time talking about it is there's confusion in the body of Christ about who exactly this is talking about and that some want to try to get what is discussed here in Daniel chapter 9 um, somehow hooked into the new covenant that Jesus has made through his blood but this is not Jesus and the covenant that he's talking about here it's not a covenant that God has made with those who are saved. But, but what he is talking about is judgment, the judgment that's going to come on humanity. Because humanity has broken the covenant. And let me, let me add this. Christians who break the covenant of their marriage vow, if you will, to Jesus, which it speaks of that in the fifth chapter of Ephesians. You know, our, our, our commitment to Jesus is supposed to be as strong or stronger than a commitment we would make to our spouse. It's like we're married to him, right? But it, the Christians who, who turn away from that, like it talks about in 2 Thessalonians 2, that apostatize, this is what you get. And if someone said, well, then why, why is God allowing this to happen? Because they've broken the covenant with him, so they end up in a covenant with the devil. The Antichrist's covenant is with those who have violated the covenant with, with yeah, he talks about that in chapter 8. But let me read this in chapter, chapter 9, verse 27. He, talking about the Antichrist, not Jesus, will enter into a strong and firm covenant with many. Now, the Amplified says with the many. We'll talk about that in just a second. But really, in the Hebrew, it's just with many. Now, if you read it with the many, we think, well, this is talking about the heads of nations or this is talking about the Council of Thirteen or something. Well, I'm sure he's entering to, into those people, but literally it just says he's entering into a covenant with many. With, just like Jesus' covenant is with whosoever will. Well, the Antichrist's covenant is with whosoever will. He will enter into a covenant with many for one week for seven years. And in the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifice and offering to cease. Now, of course, if, there, if the Jews have reinstituted some kind of animal sacrifice on the Temple Mount or something, and, which they are already doing, I understand, he's going to put a stop to that. But I'll tell you something else. He's going to put a stop to Christianity too. 
He will cause it to cease for the remaining three and one half years. And upon the wing and pinnacle of abominations shall come one who makes desolate. And he's talking about the image of the beast. And that, let me tell you, that is way farther along than anybody would care to think. Until the full de determined end is poured out on the desolator. Well, that tells you there, God's not going to let that go on forever, but it will go on as judgment. Because people have violated the terms and conditions that he set forth. So just like if you don't, you know, you, you tell your cell phone company, ah, I don't want to stay in two more years. I'm, I'm done with you guys. And they say, okay, well, you know, you owe us this amount of money. And, and you know, two years, you don't pay them that money. And then two years later, you come try to sell your house. And the realtor says, oh, there's a, there's a lien on your property. Well, where did that come from? Well, it came from your cell phone provider back there two years ago because you didn't pay them that money. Well, the, the coming of the Antichrist to humanity is a lien on humanity because they have rejected Christ. So they get the Antichrist. We'll talk more about Christ and Antichrist on Sunday. But go to Psalm 83. I'll just briefly mention that the covenant with many that it talks about there in Daniel chapter 9 does in fact involve <coughs> nations. Psalm 83 verse 2 it says, Behold, your enemies are in tumult, and those who hate God have raised up their heads. They lay crafty schemes against your people and consult together, that's a covenant, against your hidden ones. They've said, come and let us wipe them out as a nation. Let the name of Israel be in remembrance no more. They have consulted together with one accord. That's a covenant. See, the Antichrist has a covenant. This is my point. And one heart. Against you they make a covenant the tents of Eden, the Ishmaelites, Moab, and the Hagarites, Gebal, and Ammon, and Amalek, and Philistine, and the inhabitants of Tyre. And Assyria has joined with them, and they have helped the children of Lot, and have been an arm to them. Well, of course, back in King David's day, this was, those were the enemies that existed then. Well, those are, those are principalities and powers that it says over there in Ephesians that, that are coming against us. Back then, they came against Israel from those locales. They come against us all kinds of ways now, maybe not just from those geographical regions. They come at us through the television. They come at us through the government. They come at us through the, the, the world systems. But there's good news here. Psalm 89. Verse 3. God has said... I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, your seed. Now in my Bible, Psalm 89 verse 4, the seed is capitalized. We're talking about Jesus as a descendant of David through his mother Mary. Your seed, your seed I will establish forever and I will build up your throne for all generations. See, this is an everlasting covenant. Verse 27. I will make him, Jesus, the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy and loving kindness will I keep for him forevermore. And my covenant shall stand fast and be faithful with him. And his offspring, that would be us, also will I make to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. Verse 34. My covenant will I not break or profane nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. You know, God will never leave us or forsake us. Once 
For all I have sworn by my holiness, which cannot be violated. I will not lie to David. His offspring shall endure forever, and his throne shall continue as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon, the faithful witness in the heavens. I'll give you one more scripture and then we'll close. Isaiah chapter 55. You see here how there remains some things about the, the new covenant that we've not entered into yet. And that's why I believe God was impressing upon me the importance of, of keeping looking forward and not getting hung up in any of the current present details of this present darkness. Because his covenant is forever. This, this is going on. This, this is going to be beyond. Isaiah 55, verse 3. Incline your ear. Submit and consent to the divine will. See, back in the old covenant, they had to actually bring an animal to be part of the covenant. All we have to do is listen to what God has to say and agree to it. What a deal. Incline your ear and submit to the divine will and come to me here and your soul will revive. And I will make an everlasting covenant or league with you. Even the sure mercies promised to David. See, so all that we read over there in Psalm 89 was not just for David and for Solomon and for all of their, you know, bloodline. It's for us too. Behold, I've appointed him. Now, we could be David or it could be Jesus. I have appointed him to be a witness one who shall testify of salvation to the nations, a prince and a commander to the people. I'll stop there. Father, we thank you for your covenant that you have offered us freely. That you just ask that we believe you and we receive you, and that we commit our lives to live according to what you say. And Father, I thank you for your mercy, for our failures, and I thank you for your grace that enables us not to fail, and for the strength and the wisdom that we need to be your people in these difficult times. And so, Father, by your Holy Spirit, Strengthen and encourage and enlighten us so that, that we will be able to look away from all that distracts to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith, and, and that we will run the race that's set before us with joy. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.